title of my lesson today, The Challenge of Change. Change is uh, very difficult. And as you get older, more difficult. Whether it's changing a habit or an attitude or a job or a city, change is always a challenge. And change is even more difficult when it's imposed on us suddenly and without our approval. It's one thing that we're, we decide we're going to make a change, you know, a resolution or something, but when, the, when it's imposed on us, nobody asked us and we have to change, then it's really difficult. You know, a change in our health or a change in a relationship because of death or divorce or something like that, that's even more difficult. There's always an element of pain in change, even when the change is for good. For example, a new or better job in a new city means leaving friends and familiar places behind, and that's painful, no matter how good the job is. It's for this reason people naturally avoid or put off change, because they want to avoid the pain that usually accompanies change. Of course, we know that not all change is good. There are a lot of changes in life that are both painful and sad, because the change that takes place is for the worse, not for the better. You know, when you're young, you always think all the change is going to be for the better. And then you live a while, you go around the track a couple of times, you find out that, whoa, changes, you know, they're not always for the, the better. And then there are changes that change nothing. <coughs> People change, you know, careers, only to find out that their new jobs don't make them any happier than their old jobs. Or couples divorce thinking that this change is going to solve all their problems and they find out that the divorce only brings them new problems to solve. My lesson today is not about these kinds of changes. My sermon today is about the challenges that positive changes create and how we can meet and deal with these in order to appreciate fully the good things that positive changes often bring into our lives. Now the Bible is filled with stories of people who had to experience pain associated with change in order to receive the blessings that positive change brought into their lives. Let me give you a couple of examples. Abraham, my first example. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 12. Read a couple of verses there. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. <clears throat> Note the change that Abraham had to make. He had to leave his country and go live in a foreign land that he did not know. Now I want you to see the pain involved in this change. The fear of living in a different culture, language, different traditions. The pain of leaving his relatives, his home, his friends behind and leaving them for good. The risk of leaving the security of his home for the unknown place that God was sending him to. And of course, we need to balance that with the blessings associated with this change. His name and his family would be great. And God would give him many descendants and the world would be blessed through him. And so Abraham considered the change and he examined the pain and he decided that the blessings were worth it. Today, Abraham is called the father of all those who have faith. As Paul says in Galatians 3, 7, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. What a blessing to be remembered in such a way. Imagine your name, you know, John, Jack, Joe, Susie, whatever. Your name's in the Bible. And forever and ever you're, 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 you're referred to as the, the father of faith. Pretty big blessing. Lots of pain involved, but the blessings, I think, outweighed the pain. Another example is uh, Mary. She's a great example. Go to Luke chapter one, if you're following along. Luke chapter one, we'll read a bit here. Beginning in verse 26. 
Luke 1, 26. It says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of situation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth also has conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So look at the change that God put before this woman. She had to change her concept of what God could do. I mean, miraculously enable her to conceive a child without, without a man. Something that had never been done before. Of course, there would be pain involved if she accepted this change in her state. Not just you know, the suffering associated with normal childbirth, but also the possible loss of her reputation and her future husband. How am I going to explain this to Joseph? What are people going to say? All of a sudden, I'm, I'm with child, I'm not married. And also the fact that she would always be different. You ever think about that? She would always live with a knowledge and an experience that nobody else could fully understand. After all, how do you share your feelings after the miraculous conception of a divine being. I mean, who could relate to you? Who, who would get it? What woman could understand you? So she faced the pain of loneliness, solitude, I think, in her future life because of her special experience. But Mary also saw the blessings attached to the change. She would have honor with God, a special favor not given to another person man or woman. She would be the mother of a king, the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mary changed her mind about what God could and could not do, and God blessed her in a very special way, a way that no woman has or will ever be blessed again. There was pain, but there were also blessings. Example number three, one more and that'll be it. Go to Matthew 19, shall we? Matthew 19. Matthew 19, the rich young ruler. Let's go down to verse 16, Matthew 19. It says, and someone came to him and said, teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. Note the change facing the wealthy man. He had to change his value system. He valued the law and one's ability to obey the law. He valued money and the security and prestige that money gave to him. So Jesus meets this man and he challenges him to change his core values from the self-righteousness derived from obeying the law to a righteousness that will come from believing in Jesus. Hmm, there's a change from the comfort and assurance that wealth provides to trusting that Jesus will provide for him. That's the change. Now there would be pain here, 
the pain that comes from swallowing your pride and allowing your relationship with Jesus Christ to be the thing that makes you perfect and not your ability to know and obey all the rules. And also the pain that you experience when you have to rely on somebody else for all of your needs instead of yourself. Because what is it that we want most of all? What is it that we want most of all? We want to take care of ourselves. That's what we want. You talk to the people who are getting on in years and you know, there's a thought maybe they might have to move out of their homes and move to some sort of assisted living. What do they say? I'm going to stay in my house, take care of my business, I'm going to, you know, until I just can't anymore. Why? Because it's a thing about human beings. We don't want other people to take care of us. We want to take care of ourselves. We want to pay our own way. We want to you know, do our own thing. We don't want to be dependent on anybody else. Well, this young guy had to give that up and all of a sudden depend on Jesus for everything. Of course, these were not things that caused physical pain, but the psychological and spiritual discomfort of these changes were very great for this man. And yet there was a great reward to be had for making these changes. Jesus personally asked this rich young ruler to come and follow him. Just as he had personally asked James and John and Peter and Matthew, who all changed their lives and their beliefs and their jobs in order to follow Jesus as his apostles. I believe this young man could have been an apostle if he would have made the changes and followed Jesus. We could be reading one of his gospels or one of his epistles today. We could be talking about the miracles that he performed or the churches that he planted. But instead, he will always be remembered as the one who went away from Jesus sad because he couldn't change. So with all, discussion, with all this discussion about change, it brings us to a change that I would like to challenge each of us with, beginning in this new year. I mean, there's a point to this lesson. I'm not just reading over passages that you're very familiar with for the sake of reading passages that you're familiar with. There's a point here, and, and I'm getting to that point. The change that I would like to lay before you concerns our faith. And here's the challenge. I want us to decide if our faith is going to be a part of our lives or if our faith will become our lives. That's the challenge. Let me explain the difference. When faith is part of our lives, we control it. When faith is our life, it controls us. For example, when faith is part of our lives, we do you know, just enough to feel you know, no guilt. Just enough to keep our membership steady at the church. They don't you know, erase us out of the uh, directory. But when our faith is our life, then we cannot do enough for God. As in every change, there is pain connected with this kind of transformation. The pain that comes with removing self as the focus of every decision and making Christ the one that you live for. There is, for example, the inconvenience of making Jesus and his church a priority over career, recreation, even family at times. That's inconvenient. There's also the uneasiness we feel when we unplug ourselves from this world and its cares and its riches in order to pursue the kingdom of God as our first priority in everything. Well, Michael, that is, you know, you're getting to be a little zealous here. And of course, there's the embarrassment that we feel when others begin to mock and even persecute us as zealots because our religion has become our lives. You know, people do not mind if religion is just part of our lives, you know, like a hobby, but they get upset when it becomes our lives. And do you know why? Because it threatens them. You know, Muslim extremists, they threaten to kill you if you don't convert. But zealous Christians, they threaten to embarrass you if you don't get with the program. 
Oh, but there are blessings that come to us when this change is made. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, only those whose faith is their lives, only those people get to know what it's like to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, and then they get to be satisfied. And most of the time we're afraid to hunger and thirst for righteousness because it'll upset the status quo in our living in the world. When your faith is your life, you are at peace with God. You're satisfied in the deepest recesses of your soul. Another benefit, Paul says, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8. Paul's life was his faith. And when he faced death, he was absolutely assured of his place in heaven. When your Christian faith is your life, you are actually able to see and taste heaven here on earth, so you have no fear of death, and you have no fear of leaving this world. So many people, it's not the, that you know, they're afraid of the pain of death, they just don't want to leave this place here. They like this place. And if we love this place so much, it's simply a signal that the kingdom is not inside of us. Then in Acts it's written, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Acts 4, verse 4. You know, when an entire church is filled with people whose faith is their lives, the impact on the community is tremendous. You know, one of the reasons why many congregations only have a couple of hundred people after many, many years is because they only expect the ministers to live for their religion, but not the members. What's up with that? Who says I have to be the one or the elders have to be the ones to live only for faith? And everybody else is excused. You think I get paid to live for my faith? You think that's the bargain I made when I went into ministry? That any minister does when he goes into ministry? I'm going to trade getting my salary and as a return I'm going to just live for my faith. No, 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 no. No, no, the way it works is you cannot not do this. Thank God, and I really mean thank God, that he's put in a system where we can actually earn a living doing it, because I do it for free. Now, elders, I don't want you to take that the wrong way. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying. The, the perfect example is school teachers. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Why are they continually paid the lowest? Because they love what they do. They, they do it anyways. Right? It's a calling. They do it anyways. Give them 100,000 a year to do it, they'll do it. Give them 25 a year, they'll do it. Why? Because doing anything else doesn't make any sense. So next Sunday, the elders are going to, they're going to be talking about the budget. And by the way, I, I was not appointed to do this sermon because we're, you know, in my prayers and in my thinking and in my seeking of the Lord, it seemed to me this was a good time to talk about this. But next Sunday, the elders are going to be talking. Be, we'll have our worship service. They have promised to make it you know, concise quickly to kind of let the church know what's going on with the finances, where we go next year, things we want to do. Not just numbers, not just bookkeeping, but about things that we've accomplished in 2015 and some plans and dreams for the future of this church. Wouldn't you like to see our youth group go to another country on a mission trip? I think I could hear amen to that. Hey, wouldn't you like to see that? Our young people going to build a house or help a church or run a Sunday school in some other state or another country even? Wouldn't you like to see construction started out there on a new multi-purpose uh, building that would enable us to accommodate a, all congregational events? 
something we can't do now because our little fellowship hall has, you know, max 100 people in it. We're, we're pretty much maxed out for a sit down dinner. Would it be nice if we could sit 300 people now for a meal, have all kinds of activities? How about some billboard advertising on 23rd Street to really put our name in front of the community? 40,000 cars a day you know, go by. How about a push to finish paying off our mortgage? We, our property here on the corner is worth million, not a million, in the plural, millions of dollars this whole property is worth. We only have a few thousand dollars left to pay. Would it be time that we got on the stick and paid it? Many other ideas for growing the Choctaw Church to the point where we are the largest, most dynamic congregation of the Lord's body in the Eastern County. Why not? Of course, these and other plans are exciting to announce and contemplate, but usually they die on the vine if they're not preceded by the change in faith that I mentioned before. So if you're wondering, where is he going? There, it's right there. There's the, there's the connector. The things that we may talk about, exciting, whatever, you know, grandiose things that you'd like to do, I'd like to do in the future can only happen if the change takes place in faith. There's the connection. You see, the thing necessary to accomplish these great plans and dreams is not money, believe it or not. Simply creating a line item for something in the budget process doesn't automatically make that thing possible. We need to understand that the most important thing necessary to accomplish these and all other plans and dreams that we may have as a congregation is the change from part-time faith to full-time faith. That's the change. Because we cannot serve a full-time God with a part-time faith. That's, that's, the, that's the rule, that's the law. Brothers and sisters, if we accept the challenge of living full-time by faith, money will not be an issue because God promises to provide all we need if we believe all the time. So how will we know if the faith challenge for 2016 that I've laid before you is accepted? Because we know who accepted in the past by their actions, didn't we? I mean, Abraham, he left his village and he traveled to Canaan. And Mary, she accepted the angel's word and she conceived and raised that child. And we also know who didn't by their actions as well. The rich young ruler sadly rejected Jesus' offer and left, never to be heard from again. You know, no, uh, uh, you know, no after story for that guy. He just disappears, you never see him again. Well, in the same way, we will see if more of our number accept the faith challenge in 2016. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that no one here is living this way, of course not. Many are living what I'm talking about to a degree or another. My challenge to this congregation is that everybody up their game when it comes to faith in the coming year. Everybody does it. This will be evident and easy to see, why? Because there'll be more people in Bible study and worship services on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, why? Because doing this, that's a faith thing. That's a faith thing. And members will be bringing more guests, why? Because people who do this, they're acting out of faith. It's a faith thing. And parents will make a point of having their children in Bible class, you know, because they are, through faith, investing in the future spiritual lives of their children by doing this. And the offering will, go, the offering will grow up. How? It'll, it'll grow dramatically, that's how. Why? Because giving sacrificially is a sign of a faith-centered life, that's why. You know, more members will be active and involved. Some who have not done much beyond the attending of services will add to this by finding additional ways to serve and be involved. And others will find new ways to serve in addition to what they're doing now. That's, that's how it works. And those who have been giving responsibilities but have neglected them for whatever reasons will begin again to do their jobs and even train others for service. 
and there'll be more love among the members and more joy on the faces of the brethren and more willingness to sacrifice and to forgive and, and to let go the old grudges and the old hurts, you know, let them go. Why? Because that's a faith thing to let stuff like that go. God will not only add more souls to our number, but He will also shower us with blessings, both physical and spiritual, if as a body we make Him the first priority in our lives through faith. He even challenges us to do this very thing. In the book of Malachi, God speaks to His people through the voice of the prophet Malachi. The Jewish people had been slack in their service to the Lord, holding back on their sacrifices, offering Him sick and injured animals instead of giving Him their best and trusting Him to provide. And God challenges them to change this practice and He lays out the reward for those who by faith would make the necessary changes. In Malachi 3.10, what does He say to the people? He says, test me now in this says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Does God lie? No. Does God brag? Does He say things that He doesn't mean? No. Why don't we take Him up on this thing here? Why don't we say, all right, Lord, we're going to take you up on that. So I ask, what change needs to take place in your life in order to make God the priority and not just part of your life? Do you need to repent, be baptized, restore? You know, we meant, you know, some people say, why do you mention that? You know, I, I, get, I get that from people who watch this on TV. Why do you always mention, you know, People need to repent and be baptized. You know, don't, your church must know that by now. Well, the reason I, and Marty as well, and Mike too, the reason that we say that week after week is because sitting in this building are people who believe but have not repented and been baptized yet. <laughs> and you know who you are. That's why we repeat it. We repeat it over and over again and continue to repeat it until that day everyone has obeyed. But until everyone has obeyed, we just keep repeating it over and over. Is that the change? Do you need to step up your giving, your service, your attendance? Do you need prayer for your health, your marriage, your life in general, to be a greater mom, a greater man, a greater woman? Maybe the change necessary is one that only God can see. You know, abandoning a secret sin, an obsession, an addiction, perhaps giving up a grudge or negative attitude towards someone who may have offended you in the past. Or maybe you need greater faith to enable you to persevere in a difficult situation or a difficult relationship you might be in at the moment. There are moments in life when a change is necessary or a change is due. If your spirit has been stirred by this lesson, this call to change, then I do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.